Maurice Cotterell. Good to uh, talk with you again. It was a while ago, but uh, we had a, a fun time last time. A lot of interesting things uh, talking about future science and everything else. So it's uh, it's good to have you back again, Maurice. How have you been? I've been okay, Henrik. Keeping busy. Thank you very much. Yeah, indeed. There's a lot of things going on, and and uh, what we're going to get into today, of course, is uh, is a very interesting topic, and it's uh, it's timely as well for those who've been following. Is so what happened is that about two months ago now, uh, on on as we're recording this uh, on the dot, as it were, April fourteenth, we uh, got a little snail mail and it's always nice to get a snail mail by the way i really appreciate that it's always fun it feels like a privilege to, <laughs> to get a snail mail because we never get these any, anymore but anyway maurice sent us a, a a regular mail in the mail uh talking a little bit about some of the new work that he have been doing connecting some of the dots and i think we should read this letter here actually straight up to kind of get things going here a little bit uh so maurice says dear Henrik, since we last spoke dr judy wood has published a book on 9 11 where did the towers go in it, she proposes that the Twin Towers were destroyed through a process she calls dustification. She goes on to suggest that the U.S. government must therefore have used a secret energy weapon to destroy the towers. In Future Science, Forbidden Science of the 21st Century, which is uh, Maurice's latest book, I explained how anti-gravity radiation causes the molecular disintegration of matter. And I believe that this is what she unknowingly refers to. That is to say, I agree with her deductions. Moreover, she illustrates the damage caused to vehicles in the vicinity of the Twin Towers, which, for me, shows the same kind of destruction found on the returning military convoy of Saddam Hussein's army when retreating from Kuwait following the 1991 invasion, meaning that the U.S. possessed the technology as early as 1991 and used it on that occasion. And uh, you say, I'd be happy to talk to you and your listeners about this connection. And indeed, Maurice, we're very, very happy to have you with us to, to talk more about this and to really get into this, uh, you know, this work of both Judy Wood and yourself and try to connect some of these dots here. Uh, why don't you tell us first, Maurice, when you first kind of got into Judy Wood's work, when you heard about it and, and why it piqued your interest? Well, uh, it goes back to when I actually saw the first evidence on the 9-11 incident, which, of course, clearly happened way back in 2001. I reached the conclusion that it must have been a false flag operation carried out by the CIA. Uh, their intention being to control the American people through fear in an open-ended, uh, ostensible war on terror. Indeed, I believe that any reasonable person who studies the evidence will reach the same conclusion. So the question is not one of who did it or even why they did it, but one of how they did it. And, of course, there are several theories about what actually happened. One of the most plausible comes from the U.S. Institute of Architects, they believe that two aircraft colliding with the Twin Towers in the way that they did would not have caused the buildings to collapse in the way that they did. They point out that no steel frame building has ever collapsed through fire and therefore the destruction of the buildings must have been contrived. The architects suggest that the explosive thermite was used to destroy the steel supporting columns of the building floor by floor. Opponents of the idea object by saying that such a controlled demolition would have taken years to organize and that the installation and planning of such a covert operation would have been detected before completion. In response, the architects, of course, reply by saying that installation of the equipment needed for demolition could have been carried out covertly on a need-to-know basis by a select group of CIA operatives based in the neighboring so-called Building Number 7. And they point to the same day controlled demolition of Building 7 as a smoking gun that proves the same methods must have been used to destroy the Twin Towers. Only the CIA had the means, the motive, and the opportunity to destroy those towers and Building 7 in, in the way that they, it actually happened. Now, Dr. Judy Woods uh, arrived in the debate quite late in the day in 2010 with her book, Where Did the Twin Towers Go? Evidence of Free Energy Technologies on 9-11. I know she's she been the, talking about it a little bit before that, but exactly the published work uh, arrived at that stage. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, now, with, uh, what Judy uh, Woods did in 2010 with her book, uh, Where Did the Towers Go? She looked at the seismic activity on the day for the area in question around the Twin Towers and concluded that the absence of any impact data shows that the Twin Towers never actually hit the ground. She suggests that the towers, therefore, were destroyed by some kind of top-secret free energy weapon, weapon that reduced the buildings to dust and blew away in the wind. Sadly, she gives no explanation or details about how such a weapon might have been used, built, or operated. 
It's a pity that my own book, Future Science, Forbidden Science of the 21st Century, which explains how gravity works and how anti-gravity radiation can be used to disintegrate matter, was published after hers, because inclusion of that material in her book would, I believe, have made her book undisputedly formidable. Earlier this year, I watched one of her lectures uh, on UK TV when she showed how the so-called free energy beam selectively incinerated the cars and parts of the cars but had no effects on nearby trees in the vicinity of the towers. She explained away this by suggesting that the cars were insulated from electrical earth or ground, allowing energy to build up and incinerate them, whereas the trees, which were earthed, short-circuited the energy to earth and therefore suffered no damage. When I listened to her lecture, it became clear to me that both the Institute of Architects and Judy Wood were right in what they were saying. It would be impossible to disintegrate a building that was connected to Earth using anti-gravity radiation. There would just not be enough power to cause a disintegration. Therefore, it was necessary for the CIA to blast each floor of the Twin Towers away from electrical Earth before disintegration by the phaser weapon could be achieved. Judy Woods also used aerial photographs of the destroyed towers to show large circular patterns like holes or voids in the debris of the towers on the ground, which to me suggests that the anti-gravity generators had been positioned in the basements of the towers, no doubt disguised as air conditioning equipment, that would have fired the energy beams vertically into the exploding towers. So my conclusion is it seems to me that the Institute of Architects and Judy Wood are both right in their analyses. I should just add that although I believe the US, in the United States government has access to phased weapons technology, they don't appear to understand how the technology works, which means that the development of the weapons arose not from theoretical precepts, but accidentally through experimentation. Now, this, uh, the whole area of gravity and uh, anti-gravity is covered in future science. And in, in, in order to understand how matter can be disintegrated using electromagnetic radiation or gravity waves, we need to understand how it is integrated in the first place. That yeah. is to say, we need to understand how atoms bond together to form molecules. Now, we believe today that atoms bond in one of three ways. Some atoms lasso neighboring atoms with their loosely bound outer order, orbital electrons. Uh, that's known as covalent bo bonding. A second way of bonding occurs between differently charged atoms, where the differential charges of the two atoms attract them towards each other. That's ionic bonding. And the third way, which I feel is the most important in this discussion, is not understood at all by orthodox science. The problem is this. Hydrogen only has one electron, which means that the single electron cannot lasso a neighboring atom. If it did, then the hydrogen atom, which is made of one proton and one electron, would be pulled apart. So it cannot bond using the first method covalently. Neither can hydrogen atoms bond ionically without reducing the atom to an individual electron or an individual proton. So orthodox science recognizes that hydrogen must have its own unique way of bonding. So as so often happens in science, when scientists don't understand something, they give it a name, which in this case is hydrogen bonding. What I show in future science is that hydrogen bonding, which accounts for 93% of the atoms in the universe, is the prime mover in the gravitational mechanism and bonds to neighboring atoms using gravity waves that radiate from the hydrogen to capture neighboring atoms. So in order to disintegrate molecules containing hydrogen, all we have to do is generate gravity waves, then change the phase of the gravity waves by 180 degrees to make anti-gravity waves. When we bombard hydrogen-containing molecules with anti-gravity radiation, the material will disintegrate. And this is what appears to have happened on 9-11. Anti-gravity generators located in the basements of the Twin Towers sent vertical beams of anti-gravity radiation skywards that turn the buildings to dust. And there is plen plenty of evidence to suggest that this is what must have happened. Wow, interesting um, interesting idea that both could be correct, that they've used both methods or technique to, to basically make happen what we see. Uh, obviously, tons of questions that, that arise from this, and, and we'll, uh, we'll get to it here and try to detail all this. Uh, what about the, the, the possibility that, 
just to clear that off, first of all, that something else was used instead of this microwave weapon. Is there any possibility in your view, Maurice, that another type of technology actually was was uh, could have been used? Is there anything that suggests that there there could have be, I don't know, a more exotic version of a, of of a weapon that we just simply don't know about? Well, what's clearly evident is the disintegration of matter. And as I was just chatting a few minutes ago, if we are to, 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 to sort out how matter could disintegrate and blow away in the wind, then we have to get back to basics and look how it sticks together or integrates in the first place. So for me, there are some exotic theories out there. For example, that the aircraft that impacted with the towers didn't exist, that they were actually holograms and lots of other theories. But uh, what seems sensible and rational and reasonable is the fact that those towers didn't hit the ground and all the building materials that were involved in the building of those buildings, or 80% of it, disappeared and blew away in the wind. And uh, as I say, if we go back to the Iraq war, which of course was 1991, when Saddam Hussein's army was retreating from Kuwait, uh, there was a convoy of troops on Highway Number 80, I think it was called, and uh, there were 2,000 vehicles and 10,000 troops destroyed by the Americans in the space of a few hours. Now they actually uh, corralled them in. They stopped them getting out at the front and they stopped them getting out at the back. That took a few hours, about six hours. But the actual destruction by the phaser weapons didn't take long at all. And what we find, if you examine the damage on those tanks and so on is that there, there doesn't appear to be any collateral damage or structural damage to the tanks. They seem to have been incinerated from the inside out. Even the corpses are hanging out of the tanks like charcoal. And it seems to me that, uh, again, I don't believe that the CIA uh, understand how this weapon works. They just know how to use it. And I say that from my own experience because they've tried to find out how it works from me on three occasions. On twice they've tried to access my property, and on one, uh, one occasion they tried to uh, uh, threaten my life, if you like. So they wouldn't have done this if they actually understood how it works. If they had the answers and they thought I didn't have the answers, I think they would have left me alone. So T tell, us more about, one... Maurice, tell us more about that. Who... who... Uh, when did this occur? Who, who approached you? How, how do you? Did they declare who they were, etc.? Tell us more about that. What happened to you, Henrik? If I could tell you about that, it would take three hours. It's such a little. long and circuitous and interesting story. Yeah, give of course, a, give it us is, a little bit, though. A little bit more. Well, can... <laughs> no, it, it, I could name names, and they're interesting names. Uh, and I could tell you who was involved. The names are all on the internet. Are, are they British agents? Oh no, working? all no? American. Okay. Uh, as soon as Future Science was published. They tried to uh, involve me in several different ways. And uh, the, the most recent approach was uh, in October last year when, I, when two uh, CIA agents approached me and my wife on the local beach in Ireland asking for directions on picturesque local walks that they might go on. And it was no, no doubt whatsoever there were CIA agents. One was a Robert Redford look-alike, aged about 60. <laughs> she was aged about 60 with dark glasses, so I don't know what her eyes were like. But she was, she was quite open. She, came, she was German, German accent, lived in Washington, had lived there for many years. Uh, there was no question they were from out of town because all their teeth were gleaming white, not <laughs> something you see very often in Ireland. And... Uh, there was no question at all that they were there. Now, why they were there, um, you know, we were the only ones on the beach. It was in the car park at the beach. Mm -hmm. Why they would wish to approach me, maybe to get a good look at me, I don't know, or talk to me, I just don't know. But that was the last time I bumped into any of them. But uh, they okay. wouldn't show such an interest. And I have had some crazy emails as well saying, you know, we've got millions of dollars to support you in your research. But, of course, anybody with millions of dollars in the USA is either mafia or CIA. You know, we all know the government in the USA is controlled by the CIA. You know, the CIA is the enforcement arm of the Freemasons in America. Now, one might ask, why would the CIA wish to control the government? Well, I think one of the, the, the biggest uh, researchers on this line is David Icke, who has suggested that the aim of the Freemasons appears to be one of one world government, which would allow complete control of the masses by the Freemasons, who see themselves as masters of the universe, and the rest of us as slaves. 
Now, well, control is a pretty good incentive, and people have been involved in that since the dawn of man, pretty much. So <laughs> that's that's understandable. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, of course, I have to say that Freemasonry was not always like this. As I'm sure you know, Henrik, there was a time when Freemasonry was a force for good. This is clearly evidenced by the works of the Freemasons themselves, who built the Pyramids of Egypt, Pyramids of Mexico, Pyramids of Peru. They built the Gothic cathedrals throughout Europe during the Middle Ages. In those days, they worshipped the sun as God. They believed in the notion of body and soul, that souls who had led a good life go to heaven, whereas bad souls reincarnate on earth, which they recognize as planet prison or hell. Now, of course, lots of people today are talking about the earth being planet prison. They don't realize how close to the truth they really are. It seems that a schism developed in Freemasonry at around the time of the Reformation in Germany, at around 1700. Having figured out the mechanism of heaven and hell and reincarnation, some Freemasons decided it was just too difficult to be good. And so instead, they decided it was far easier to become masters of hell rather than servants of God in heaven. Now, this explains why Freemasons work until they drop dead. It doesn't matter how much money they might have, they know they will reincarnate into the same family and get the money back again. This is why the pharaohs of Egypt and the Incas of Peru married only their sisters. They knew they would reincarnate. If they didn't get to heaven this time around, they knew they would reincarnate to the same DNA. And if they didn't get to heaven, then they would come back as a prince or a princess, which would give them a better chance of getting to heaven the next time around. Clearly, the CIA Freemasons have gone off the rails completely. They believe themselves to be masters of the earth. Now, it's interesting that President Kennedy was an Irish Catholic, and of course, Catholics abhor Freemasonry. Now, he tried to get rid of uh, uh, Freemasons in the, in, in the, uh, the Freemasonry influence in the United States in the 1960s. So in, the 19, in 1962, the CIA killed him and actually got away with it. Now, the CIA began to understand that the greater the atrocity they committed, the less chance that anyone would believe that they were involved. So after 1962, the CIA took control of every single U.S. government. This is why Obama flip-flops on every issue and promise. When he gets into office, he promises to close Guantanamo Bay. Then the CIA won't let him. Uh, and then he, he tells us that CIA, uh, that Guantanamo Bay uh, is required for national security. It's the CIA sure. that runs the USA, not the, the U.S. government. Sure. And we've even seen this today and yesterday with this new whistleblower, uh, Edward Summers, uh, Ed, Sum, uh, Ed Snowden. 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 Edward Snowden, yeah. 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 Now, you see, what's happening now is that uh, the surveillance state in the U.S. is so all-pervasive that the whistleblowers like Julian Assange, who spilt the beans and then sat tight and almost got arrested, they now know they can't sit tight because they'll be executed by the U.S. administration, the U.S. government. So now what we see, that their techniques are changing. What we see with Edward Snowden is that he's spilt the beans and ran off and defected to China, just like the That's spies amazing. did in the 60s at the height of the Cold War. So the CIA, by not going through due process, by not allowing uh, Julian Assange freedom of speech, by not allowing the press in the USA freedom of speech, by not allowing the, the due process of law to be carried out to, to find out if somebody is guilty or innocent, they're executing people on a whim and the, the say-so of the CIA. Already, the UK government, four days ago, issued a, a, a letter to all airlines saying that uh, they must not allow uh, Edward uh, Snowden to fly on aircraft into the UK. Well, of course they don't want him to come to the UK because it's cost them five million just to keep Julian Assange in the Ecuadorian embassy. The last thing is they want is another guy coming and another five million every six months to keep somebody else somewhere else. Yeah. So what is, the, whole, the pendulum is beginning to swing now and, and Edward uh, Snowden will be of more use alive to the Chinese, they'll probably set him up with a little Chinese girl in a nice apartment and he'll be happy for the rest of his life, <laughs> just like the Russians used to do. And he'll give them a lot more information than the Americans would have 
released if they had given him a fair trial and let him have his say in a free and democratic society. And this is what's gone wrong now. We've got a police state in America. We've got a police state in the UK. The UK are finding people guilty without due process. They've already said that this guy is a spy, that this guy has released, has breached uh, the US laws. He's not had a trial. He's not had a defense. We're supposed to be a, a, a civilized society. And yet, in fact, all that civilization has gone out of the window yeah. in support of a surveillance state. Yeah, well, of course. I mean, murder and, and mayhem standard procedure, as, as usual, it's just all illusions that things are, are you know, civilized at this stage. I, I wanted to, and this is a very interesting, you know, conversation that we're having here because of the fact that it also dovetails with 9-11 of, of everything that has uh, just run amok out of control after this this event, of course. But I wanted to quickly bring us back again to 1993 and, and talk a little bit about the events in, in Iraq, what happened then there, because I think this was referred to as the Highway of Death, the Highway 80 that you talked about, uh, and, and what you remember from the event and if there was if there's any uh, footage or if this is just basically uh, what, what military personnel has talked about or anything like that. I don't remember the event too much back in, in 93, but you're saying that they used a either the exactly the same or, or maybe a lesser version of the same weapon that was used on 9-11 there. So, so I, tell us about that. I believe it was a far lesser version. It was probably a prototype because the ones in the Twin Towers were based in the basement and they had access to mains electricity. So they could convert the mains into the gravity waves, then delay the gravity waves by 180 degrees, turn them into anti-gravity waves. That's a lot of power. And providing each floor was disconnected from Earth, they would be incinerated. But back in 91, they probably were using smaller weapons uh, from satellites, orbital satellites. So uh, the satellite would have taken a beam from the back of the convoy to the front of the convoy and just swept it and incinerated everything inside every vehicle. So, uh, I mean, it, was, it has been described as the most disproportionate use of military force in the history of mankind, whereby the retreating... Uh, Iraqi army was supposed to be protected under the Geneva Convention. Uh, I think it's Article 3 which outlaws the killing of soldiers who are not in combat. Now, of course, they were not in combat. They were returning home uh, trying to follow through on a UN resolution to evacuate Kuwait. And yet, when they tried to comply with the UN resolution, they were destroyed. And as I say, the reports I've had, and if you look at Wikipedia, they've got uh, a good account of it, of uh, the various uh, thoughts about the incident, and uh, how it was, it did, it did not show the USA in a very good light, because again, it seems the USA is violating freedom, it's violating the Geneva Convention, it's reinterpreting the English language to suit itself, it's... Uh, that they use expressions like uh, serious consequences and decide what serious consequences are likely to mean if it suits them. Uh, it, it, it talks about using reasonable force when, you know, anybody who studied law knows that the test of reasonableness is very difficult to define. And, uh, I mean, the poor Americans, all of their constitution is going out of the window. Uh, they're all being uh, placed under surveillance. All the emails, Skype, all their activities are being monitored and uh, stored for future use. And what this means is even the most saintly of Americans in the future could be stitched up by the CIA by making a case for people uh, who are perfectly innocent, but they cut out the innocent bits and put down the mysterious bits and create a sentence which shows somebody might just be off their trolley. And, uh, you know, it's like the Boston bombers. What, they, what happens is they, they pick on a couple of kids, they... Uh, they groom them, they offer to put them through college, they pay their fees, and they set them up. And in the same way, it's the same thing's happening today in Iraq, where the Iraqi government, every day we, we switch on the TV and we hear about these suicide bombers. Well, I, I'm very skeptical about these suicide bombers. Most of these suicide bombers are delivering loaves of bread and delivering books and delivering all sorts of goods and know nothing about the true nature of the cargo they're carrying and they're being blown up by the governments who claim under a false flag premise 
that these suicide bombers are killing people and therefore this should instigate change and uh, a change in policy and, and so on, mm -hmm. when in fact it's the governments themselves that are doing it in order to instill fear and uh, take control over the populations. Yeah, that's right. Absolutely right. Uh, I wanted to talk about the progression of, of the weapon, the theorized weapon that we're talking about here. Uh, but first, tell us what you think about who actually developed it because you said that they basically don't understand what they've developed as you suggested so who who was there in the beginning how do you think that it it was developed accident experimentation well, it's experimentation henrik yes in for example when i was uh, researching future science i came out over accounts of uh, a team of uh, scientists at yale university school of engineering in 2000, uh, 2009 and they, in my view, had successfully generated gravity radiation and its corollary anti-gravity radiation. And that was a, an article in Nature, I think it was about August 2009. Now, of course, they don't know and didn't know until I wrote to them in 2011 that they have discovered gravity and anti-gravity radiation. Now, what they were doing was this team of researchers discovered an attractive force of light and showed it how it could be used like tweezers to manipulate electrons in semiconducting and micro and nano devices. Then they split the beam, the infrared beam, into two streams. They passed one along a transmission line, which they described as a silicon nanowire nano waveguide, mm -hmm. which delayed the propagation of that part of the beam by 180 degrees. And the delayed beam had the opposite effect. It pushed on the electrons in the nano components instead of pulling on them. Now, they don't know that this is gravity and anti-gravity. They just thought that it's an interesting idea, it's an interesting discovery. But then what happened was, uh, there was another account, another documented account that skips from 2009 to 2011. This is either side, uh, this is the other side, of course, of the Iraq war, which ended in uh, 91, so it's 20 years later. But uh, there was a report in Science Daily in January 2011, from, uh, and it said that the Orion Nebula in space produces circularly polarized light. Now, I call gravity uh, helically polarized, corkscrew polarized light, which is the same thing. If you look down the end of it, it looks like a circle, but I know it to be a corkscrew shape. It's actually corkscrew and cone shaped, so it's helically polarized, like a helix. And uh, what they were saying was that circularly polarized light, 17% of it in the infrared range, is capable of breaking the covalent bonds in I atoms of ice molecules in space. Now, what's happened here is that that percentage of the infrared light, and they've also discovered it happens in the ultraviolet as well, because these are different harmonics of the gravity wave radiation frequency, which is 1.42 gigahertz, or cycles per second. Now, what they've discovered is that the anti-gravity radiation in space, which has been delayed naturally as it's traveled, as against the gravity radiation, will disintegrate ice molecules. In other words, because ice contains hydrogen and, it's, and therefore ice bonds using hydrogen bonding, which is gravity bonding, if you bombard ice molecules with anti-gravity, then the ice will disintegrate. And that's what they've discovered in the Orion Nebula. In other words, they've seen this phenomenon actually take place in space. Now, what they've done, I mean, it, it also happened, a similar uh, thing happened in, oh, I forget the exact year now, uh, I think it was 2006, where two scientists in, uh, in Austria at the European Space Agency figured out a, a way of generating gravity waves. Now, what they did was, it was an accident, they were trying to figure out if there was any gravitational changes in the laboratory where they worked to see if they could monitor them and try and figure out what was making gravity change, if indeed it did. And what they noticed was that every day at the same time, the gravity would change about 1 o'clock, and every time it would change again at 2 o'clock. And they tracked this down to the office beneath the laboratory where they were conducting these experiments with very fine uh, balances uh, which measured the changes in gravity. And what they tracked it down to was a spinning CD-ROM in the guy's computer downstairs. Whenever he went for lunch and switched his computer off, the gravity upstairs changed. 
and when he came back from lunch and switched his computer on again, the gravity changed back to how it was. So they put spinning mm. CD-ROMs inside a glass case where there was no wind, no magnetic fields, and all the rest of it. Mm -hmm. And they did experiments, speeding up the disk, slowing down the disk, and they put the scales on top of the, the spinning disk, and every time they changed the speed of the disk, the gravity changed. So from that, these two physicists at the European Space Agency uh, did more and more experiments, and these are two of the most senior physicists in the world. And uh, they produced what they called a gravity wave generator and applied for a patent with the, uh, initially, the European Space Agency, through the European Space Agency, through, uh, uh, with the interna the, an international application uh, through the, uh, the gravity uh, people. Right, right. And uh, mm -hmm. the, the, uh, it did seem to work. And what, all it looks like is a disk. And you, if you draw a, a cross on this disk, and put a magnet on each uh, point of the cross, and then attach a magnet to the side of the disc. In other words, so the, the magnet is spinning like a wheel, a small wheel. So you've got four small magnets at right angles to the main disc, spinning as the wheel spins. Now what happens is, as those magnets spin from North Pole to South Pole, and as the disc itself spins, then you get corkscrew magnetic fields coming off the disc. And this is exactly what happens with the hydrogen atom. When an electron orbits a hydrogen atom, it changes, the electron at one moment in time is electric, but then it becomes magnetic, then it returns to being electric, then it becomes magnetic again. So for half the time, the atom is electric, and for half the time, the uh, atom is uh, magnetic. Now, this is the problem with modern physics today. They believe the atom to be electric when it isn't. It's only electric half the time. This is why they cannot understand why an electric current produces a magnetic field, because they don't know where the magnetism's coming from. And it's because when a moving electron ejects from an atom, it must be in the magnetic mode as it spins. And as it spins, it, it uh, creates a magnetic... As it spins in a helix along the wire, it leaves a magnetic field which appears to be 90 degrees to the current flow. And that's why uh, a moving electron or an electric current produces a magnetic field. Now, modern scientists don't understand magnetism. They don't understand why a fridge magnet sticks to the door of a, of a fridge. They don't understand how electricity works. They don't understand why the atom is stable. In fact, there's nothing modern science understands. They don't understand how gravity works. They don't understand why something drops to the floor when it's released. They haven't got a clue. All of these Isaac, things are... Isaac Newton, yeah. Isaac Newton tried to figure it out. Albert Einstein figured it out, and neither of them could. All of this is uh, basically effects of, of something which they don't understand. It's something that has a, an effect in our in our world, and we can see it, you know, what, with, when something falls to the, the ground, etc. Et but what actually is generating it behind the scenes, if you will, everything, that's, some, that's, a, that's a phenomena that is not understood, correct? How, how would you explain how it works? Where does it... Uh, okay, it's not from. understood by them. It's perfectly understood by me. Uh, all you need is, you could use a spinning disk, like the two guys in Austria, whose patent was denied, on the grounds that they didn't understand what they were talking about. So although their gravity wave generator worked, it was demonstrated to work, they were denied the patent on their machine. I'm only going back to 2007. Now, their patent was des uh, denied I think it was uh, about five months after I gave my first lecture in Colorado, excuse me, in Nevada uh, at a conference explaining how gravity works. Now, it's easy how it works. Uh, what happens is, as the electron moves around the hydrogen atom, it gives off corkscrew-style magnetic waves. Those corkscrew-style magnetic waves affect other atoms now, other atoms are bigger and more complicated than hydrogen. Hydrogen is very simple. It has a proton and it has an electron, just one of each of the two fundamental particles. Now, the other atoms uh, are more complicated. Helium is the next most complicated atom. It has two electrons, two protons, and two neutrons. Now, the next atom up, lithium, is even more complicated. That has three protons, three electrons, three neutrons. But lithium now, it starts to get 
different with lithium because the second orbital shell of lithium is offset from the first. Now, this makes lithium wobble. So it doesn't spin like hydrogen, and it doesn't spin like helium because they've only got one shell. And so they spin perfectly smoothly like a record turntable, if you like. Mm -hmm. But every atom after hydrogen and helium wobbles or tumbles. They don't spin autonomously. And we have to remember that they've got neutrons. Now, neutrons are actually spike-shaped. They've got a positive end and a negative end. They're like needles. And again, this was revealed in a Science Daily report in 2011 from a university uh, in Germany called the Hahn Meitner Institute. And they're talking about spiked neutrons have polarized magnetic fields, which means that they must be long and thin. Now, in the case of hydrogen and helium, these are the prime movers in the atomic mechanism. So all you have to do is take a, a, a hydrogen atom or a helium atom and put it near another complicated atom that's tumbling all over the place like tumbleweed. It's not spinning because all the electrons spinning in the different shells are all going in different directions. So it's tumbling all over the place until the radiation from hydrogen or helium causes it to spin in the same direction as the hydrogen or the helium. And as soon as that happens, the next atom, for example, lithium or any other atom, carbon, calcium, whatever it is, it's, once it starts spinning in the same direction as hydrogen and helium, that too starts radiating gravity waves because it's spinning in the same direction. So that atom attracts the next atom. Now, if you wish to generate gravity waves, all you have to do is get a bucket of water which contains hydrogen and stick it in front of 120 containers, or 119 in this case. And those containers would each contain one each of the elements of the periodic table. So the first bucket would be water, which contains hydrogen. The second bucket would contain helium. The third container would contain lithium. The fourth container would contain beryllium. The fifth container and so would, would contain boron and oxygen and, 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 all, and sorry, carbon and all of the other, other atoms. Mm -hmm. And what will happen is the, the, the corkscrew waves from the hydrogen and the helium will cause all of the other elements, the 119 elements which you've lined up in a line to start spinning in the same direction. And that will give you free energy. It will get red hot. And in fact, uh, there, was, there is an invention you've probably heard of called the ECAT generator sure. by yeah. Andrea Rossi. Yeah. Now, they claim that their machine works by cold fusion, which it does not. As I explain in Future Science, it works by a process I call periodic scaling. And this is what you do when you put hydrogen, which is what they do in the ECAT generator, into, close to uh, nickel. They've chosen nickel, but it could be any of the other elements, actually. And the nickel starts to sp the hydrogen causes the nickel to spin in the same direction. The nickel starts to get hot. The, heat, the, the infrared heat then from the nickel heats up the hydrogen more and the hydrogen sucks in the heat and starts to radiate more gravity waves which causes the nickel to heat up even more and we have a runaway escalation in heat between the two and uh, the hydrogen continually sucks in heat and radiates gravity waves. This is why liquid hydrogen and liquid helium are the most, are the coldest of all of the gases. This is why we use them in machines like uh, the MRI scanner, for example, mm -hmm. as liquid helium to cool the magnets down. And that liquid helium costs 10% of the machine. So if a, a magnetic resonance imaging uh, machine costs about uh, 500,000 pounds, which is what it does, the helium coolant alone is 50,000 quid. Just, and we, there is no helium. It's so expensive. It's about $25 a liter. So I found a way of making helium by simply by bringing two deuterium atoms together with the right magnetic orientation. Now, there are only eight magnetic orientations for every orbiting electron. For example, it can be all electric at one moment in time. It can be half electric, half magnetic. Then it's all magnetic as it 
becomes vertical. Then it becomes half magnetic and half electric, becoming horizontal again. Then as it gets around the far side of the atom, it's horizontal again, so it's back to being electrical. Then it reverses north-south polarity. It goes up in the air again and becomes half electric, half magnetic. Then it becomes magnetic again. And if we look at the possibilities, there are only eight possibilities to the, uh, any electron orbiting any atom. Now, this is fascinating because two of those possibilities are electric. When the electron is at zero degrees and 180 degrees, they're both electric. They're both the same. When it's magnetic on the left-hand side, it's either north or it's south. And when it's on the right-hand side of the atom, it's either north or it's south. So what we've got is actually, although there's eight positions to the electron as it orbits the hydrogen atom, there are only seven different magnetic orientations. And what this means is, if you hear some music, the music will cause vibrations of a certain electromagnetic uh, 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 orientation, which means that one-seventh of all of the atoms in your body will vibrate at that particular musical note. There are seven notes in the octave before you get back to do again. So we've got do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do. We've got two do's, which is like the two electrical positions of the atom. So there are only seven positions of the atom can be in, electromagnetic positions. So when you hear a note which resonates with uh, harmony in your body and harmony in all of the atoms of the universe, which is one of those seven configurations, then you will feel peaceful. If you will hear a note which is sharp or flat, which is not either perfectly electrical, 50% electrical, 50% magnetic, all magnetic, 50% magnetic, 50% electrical. Again, if it's not perfectly resonating with those, you will feel dissonance, and the music will make you feel afraid or screechy. And this is why music affects us. This is why some music makes us feel comfortable, some makes us feel bad, because any random sample of atoms in a human body or table or kitchen kettle any random position of atoms can only be in one of seven positions electromagnetically. And that's why if the position of a string, which is harmo harmonically divided into perfect uh, harmonics, uh, causes a vibration in those atoms in your body, you'll feel good, and if it doesn't, you'll feel bad. So in answer to your question, how do we generate gravity waves, you put hydrogen in front of any other atom and it will cause the electrons in that atom to spin in the same direction instead of tumbling erratically. And that will produce more gravity radiation, which will affect more atoms, and they will start spinning in the same direction, which will pro provide more gravity radiation. And so if you get a line of atoms, they will all attract each other as they all start spinning in the same direction. And it's as simple as that. Now, if you want to create anti-gravity, simply get the beam at any stage, pass it through a phase delay of 180 degrees, and you'll finish up with the antiphase of the gravity. So instead of drawing atoms together, you'll move atoms apart. And, and that's how it was, uh, that's how you shatter matter, basically, in that sense. That that's how you shatter matter. Just, you, know, you generate the hydrogen, mm -hmm. you know, use water or hydrogen, bung it in front of some uh, very... In the case of nickel, of course, nickel's a unique atom because iron, cobalt, and nickel are the three magnetic atoms. And they're unique because uh, the shells or subshells of the atoms come in eights. Because the, the electron can be in one of eight positions, because there are eight, position, eight magnetic positions to every electron, it means you can only have eight electrons in every, any subshell of an atom. So, for example, the second shell of the atom is described as having 18 electrons in, in the second orbital shell. In fact, it doesn't have 18 orbiting electrons. What it has is two shells offset by 90 degrees. You have a shell containing eight electrons and another shell at the same radius. So it's, it's, it fools the observer because the radius of the second shell, subshell, is offset by 90 degrees, they appear to occupy the same distance from the center. So if you look at the atom, they appear to be 16 electrons in the, sec in the second shell, when in fact there are two lots of eight separated by 90 degrees. Because you can't have more than eight because, because of the magnetic moments change every 45 degrees. And eight times 45 is 360. So, mm. uh, 
what we have then, with iron, we have uh, 26 electrons, and you can have more because it's an isotope. Cobalt, 27 electrons, and uh, nickel, 28 electrons. Now, these are, the odd, these are the odd atoms out. This is why they're magnetic. You've got the extra two electrons, possibly. If you don't have them, you've got iron, just 26. But if you get the extra electron, you get 27. And if you get the extra two electrons, you get 28. And the reason for that is because the two electrons in the first shell of the atom are 180 degrees displaced from those in the second shell of 18. I should call it the third shell because I'm referring to the first shell of two as the first. So the second shell would contain eight. The third shell of the atom would contain either 16 or 18. Okay. And this is why the third shell contains 18. And so, I mean, scientists don't understand why the shells of atoms contain the number of electrons they do, which is two in the first shell, eight in the second shell, up to 18 in the third shell. It could be either 16, 17, or 18. And, and that, this is facilitated by the first two, which cancel them out. And then 32 in the third shell, uh, 64, uh, sorry, 32 in the, the, the fifth, uh, up to 18 again in the uh, sixth, eight, then followed by eight, mm. then followed by uh, 18, then two again. So we get this symmetry throughout the atom because the magnetic moments of all the electrons are changing as the at atom fills up with electrons. Now, this may sound convoluted in a radio uh, rendition, but in future science, if you put it down in a few pictures, it becomes obvious and it's simple. It's so simple how all of this stuff works. You have a couple of good graphs on that and, and periodic scaling and everything else that explains this. We want to give you time to uh, you know, follow through on your thoughts here, of course, but there's many more questions I have about the application and the, and the functionality, I guess, of a weapon like this. And let me ask you some of that. How would you, because what you're explaining is also kind of a runaway feedback loop, and there's a number of questions that arise from this uh, when you, you know, between the hydrogen and, and nickel or whatever other, you know, material you use, as you explained. How do you stop it from, from just being a runaway kind of feedback loop? I mean, how do you control output and effect, and how do you, uh, you know, what, what's your suggestions on some of those questions of how this would just simply not either run out of control completely or, or not be not enough to generate the effect that you want to have, etc. Okay. What happens is, we know from uh, people who've done anti-gravity experiments, there was uh, a guy, oh, what's his name? He uh, he's invented a, a flying saucer, been on coast to coast. can't think of his name now. Hmm. Uh, yeah, who is what that? What he found was, when he switched his machine on, it sucked in heat. The room went cold, he says, if you look at all his, all his literature. When you switch his flying saucer on, the room goes cold. That's because the hydrogen sucks in the heat and re-radiates the energy as gravity waves. So uh, the, the constraining factor, the limiting factor with the runaway reaction, if you like, which you would get in a nuclear reactor, which you don't get in periodic scaling, is that you are limited to, heat, to the available heat in the room and energy transfer considerations. In other words, if you were to do it inside a lead-lined refrigerator and could somehow shield the gravity waves as well, and of course you can't shield gravity waves because when a gravity wave hits something, it causes the atoms in the shield to spin in the same direction, and the atoms in the shield then radiate gravity waves in the same direction. So it looks like you can't shield gravity, but in fact, what's happening is when you shine the gravity wave onto a plate, a vertical plate, the plate then spins, all of the atoms in the plate spin in the same direction and radiate gravity waves, and it looks like the original gravity wave has gone straight through, but of course it hasn't. It's a two-stage process. So uh, what you're limited to is uh, ambient heat, basically, and energy. there's only a certain amount of energy that will transfer between atoms, depending on the surface area of the atom, depending on the atomic content of the atom. We're not dealing with nuclear radiation here or nuclear breakdown. We're simply dealing with gravity, which is, uh, uh, begins in the gigahertz frequency of 1.42 gigahertz, and then the harmonics in the infrared and ultraviolet also affect uh, smaller volumes of atoms, like water and things like that. So the thing about uh, 
anti-gravity, he said it will disintegrate anything with, with hydrogen in it, which, as I say, 93% of atoms in the universe contain hydrogen. So virtually anything with hydrogen, like human bodies and water, will all disintegrate when you shine anti-gravity on them. Now... Uh, okay, so well, l let me ask you this then, in terms of some of the people that was, that was shown there. Some people jumped out of the towers, um, which is kind of interesting because there seems to have been, uh, you know, obviously an, an, an effect or something. I mean, I don't know how to explain that, why people jumped out of there. W could there be, in, in such an application of a weapon like this, kind of a, I don't know how to term this, a, 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 you know, a, a lesser effect and then more effect. Basically, this is something you could feel being on an increase. Or would it work instantaneously, meaning that it would just, either it's on and it disintegrates or it's off and there's no effect at all? Or is there an in-between stage of using something like this, do you think? Again, it depends. If the human being is connected to Earth, the energy, uh, and, and of course, in this case, we're dealing with very large amounts of energy supplied by the mains in the basement. But uh, how, how much uh, energy? Give us an estimate. What, how much are we talking about, do you think? Oh, millions, millions. Uh, we're talking about gigawatts, probably. Gigawatts, okay. Yep. I would think so. Yep. Now, of course, as long as human beings holding onto the building and the building's attached to the Earth, it would, it would be like being in a microwave. They'd get hot and prickly and sticky and, and scratchy. But as soon as they jumped off, they'd disintegrate. Hmm. You see the difference? It's the same as the cars and the trees that we observed. Th so, let, let, let me ask you this as well. Uh, so many interesting uh, thoughts that arise here when we talk about this. There is also this extremely high temperature phenomena recorded at Ground Zero, been, been documented by various sources. Uh, if if the 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 weapon is located in the basement of this, would it be further down, subterranean, underneath all this that was going on? Or was this part of the, did the whole thing disintegrate? Because again, maybe of some some kind of run, runaway uh, uh, feedback that was happening. What, what, what do you think about that? If I were doing it, uh, I would put anti-gravity generators in the basement so the beam goes upwards, and I would disguise them as air conditioning fans. Mm -hmm. So I would just allow the radiation coming from the source, which would probably be hydrogen with a lot of large elements that the hydrogen could stimulate. We're talking about stimulated emission. So I'd put probably hydrogen, nickel, uh, maybe plutonium, uh, lots of atoms like that, which would give off an lo awful lot of gravity radiation and uh, just switch them on. And as the buildings were blown apart, as the, each floor was blown apart, that's when they would disintegrate. It's a bit like a microwave oven. If you put a glass plate in, it will not get hot. But if you put food containing water in, it gets hot because the hydrogen atoms move backwards and forwards, bang into each other and create heat. And that's the same sort of thing you're going to get with the building. But we have to remember that cement contains water and, old, and iron and steel all contain hydrogen. Uh, so various types of hydrogen. So uh, it, certain things would get blown away as dust and certain things would not. Uh, why, do you, why do you think it is that it started from the top going downwards, reverse? Well, you couldn't, do it, you couldn't do it any other way. As I say, let's imagine that the power in the, the beam was only sufficient to destroy one floor at a time, and that was a limiting factor. Let's say it was 10 gigawatts. It takes 10 gigawatts, for example, I don't know what the power was, it takes 10 gigawatts to destroy one floor providing it's not connected to Earth. So what they had to do was blow the floor off firstly with thermite, so it was in midair, and then the 10 gigawatts would disintegrate it, just like the food in the microwave oven. Then a second later, or three seconds later, whatever it is, they disintegrate, they blow apart the next floor down. Well, you can't start from the bottom floor, clearly, because if you started from the bottom floor, the 200 floors above would not be disintegrated by your 10 gigawatts. You would need 2,000, 200 times 10 gigawatts, which is 2,000 gigawatts, which they can't do. They're limited by the cables feeding the anti-gravity generator and so on. So it had to be a top-down destruction. And, and it seems reasonable. You know, buildings don't normally just fall down from the bottom up one, one floor at a time. It's something that you, you might expect in a, a common sense sort of practical way. Mm -hmm. If a building's collapsing, it would collapse from the top down. 
Very interesting indeed, uh, Maurice. We want to continue listening to your ideas and theories about this in, in the next segment. I want to take a little break here. Just a couple of more questions before we do that, though. Uh, have you been in contact with Judy uh, at all at this stage about some of your suggestions? No, I haven't. Uh, I mean, I sent her, I saw a, uh, a program on TV uh, who mentioned her. I sent them a, an email saying, this is what I believe, and I never heard anything back. So maybe she's not interested in how anti gravity works. I have no idea. Or maybe she never got it. Maybe if they are, if they hear the, the show and are interested, they can, of course, get in contact through, you, through your website, correct? Of course, yes. My email is on the website, and the website's www.mauricecottrell.com. All right, interesting. Have you um, thought about, or are you in the works of doing a, a little bit more elaborate paper, let's say, for on this topic for people who want to look at more of the, the numbers and such that we haven't uh, yet uh, gotten time to get to here? Well, no, I'm doing a lot of work, Henry, but not. I've had enough of books. I've done about a dozen books, and they've worn me out. So um, I can't switch my brain off. I'd like to just retire. I'm 61 now, but it won't switch off, unfortunately. <laughs> but, uh, I've, for example, the last few weeks, I've discovered how to make helium from deuterium. And I believe we can make any of the elements, for example, gold, uh, simply. But the problem is I can't make helium because I don't have deuterium, mm -hmm. and I don't have the money to build the equipment required. I believe I could make gold, but I don't have a particle accelerator and I don't have the funding to do it. But all of these questions uh, interest me and it's like the uh, Andrea Rossi ECAT generator. I'm sure his generator produces free energy and I know how it works. It's coming from the hydrogen atoms, stimulating it, the emission in the nickel atoms. It has nothing whatsoever to do with cold fusion. It's periodic scaling as described in Future Science. So I'm answering lots of uh, other questions that have arisen from future science, but, uh, and I'm sending out mail shots to people who might be interested, uh, but I, I can't really take these ideas forward because I don't have the funding, and even if I did, I'm not that kind of a guy. I am an analyst. I analyze things. I'm not really a hands-on prototype type of person. Mm -hmm. I get bored at that stage, and I want to move on and you know, discover something else. But clearly what, what fascinates me is the fact that, for example, uh, hydrogen bonding holds together the atoms of the human body. And what that means is hydrogen, the hydrogen bonds are created by gravity waves moving at the speed of light. So if a human being ever went faster than light, it would go faster than the gravity waves holding it together. So it would disintegrate because the bonds would fail. So Einstein was right. Human beings can never travel faster than the speed of light, but he was right for all the wrong reasons. In fact, I'm absolutely certain that relativity is nonsense. And of course, it's not his, but I also believe that quantum theory is nonsense. Uh, and science is completely wrong because they don't understand the atom or they don't understand gravity. And of course, it's not surprising if you don't understand one of the fundamental forces of nature, how on earth can you propose to be a scientist when they don't understand uh, now, with, uh, what Judy uh, Woods did in 2010 with her book, uh, Where Did the Towers Go? She looked at the seismic activity on the day for the area in question around the Twin Towers and concluded that the absence of any impact data shows that the Twin Towers never actually hit the ground. She suggests that the towers, therefore, were destroyed by some kind of top-secret free energy weapon, weapon that reduced the buildings to dust and blew away in the wind. Sadly, she gives no explanation or details about how such a weapon might have been used, built, or operated. It's a pity that my own book, Future Science, Forbidden Science of the 21st Century, which explains how gravity works and how anti-gravity radiation can be used to disintegrate matter, was published after hers, because inclusion of that material in her book would, I believe, have made her book undisputedly formidable. Earlier this year, I watched one of her lectures uh, on UK TV when she showed how the so-called free energy beam selectively incinerated the cars and parts of the cars but had no effects on nearby trees in the vicinity of the towers. She explained away this by suggesting that the cars were insulated from electrical earth or ground, allowing energy to build up and incinerate them, whereas the trees, which were earthed, short-circuited the energy to earth and therefore suffered no damage. When I listened to her lecture, it became clear to me that both the Institute of Architects and Judy Wood were right in what they were saying. 
It would be impossible to disintegrate a building that was connected to Earth using anti-gravity radiation. There would just not be enough power to cause a disintegration. Therefore, it was necessary for the CIA to blast each floor of the Twin Towers away from electrical Earth before disintegration by the phaser weapon could be achieved. Judy Woods also used aerial photographs of the destroyed towers to show large circular patterns like holes or voids in the debris of the towers on the ground, which to me suggests that the anti-gravity generators had been positioned in the basements of the towers, no doubt disguised as air conditioning equipment, that would have fired the energy beams vertically into the exploding towers. So my conclusion is, it seems to me that the Institute of Architects and Judy Wood are both right in their analyses. I should just add that although I believe the US, you, in the United States government has access to phased weapons technology, they don't appear to understand how the technology works, which means that the development of the weapons arose not from theoretical precepts, but accidentally through experimentation. Now, this, uh, the whole area of gravity and uh, anti-gravity is covered in future science. And in, in, in order to understand how matter can be disintegrated using electromagnetic radiation or gravity waves, we need to understand how it is integrated in the first place. That yeah. is to say, we need to understand how atoms bond together to form molecules. Now, we believe today that atoms bond in one of three ways. Some atoms lasso neighboring atoms with their loosely bound outer order, orbital electrons. Uh, that's known as covalent bo bonding. A second way of bonding occurs between differently charged atoms, where the differential charges of the two atoms attract them towards each other. That's ionic bonding. And the third way, which I feel is the most important in this discussion, is not understood at all by orthodox science. The problem is this, hydrogen only has one electron, which means that the single electron cannot lasso a neighboring atom. If it did, then the hydrogen atom, which is made of one proton and one electron, would be pulled apart. So it cannot bond using the first method covalently. Neither can hydrogen atoms bond ionically without reducing the atom to an individual electron or an individual proton. So orthodox science recognizes that hydrogen must have its own unique way of bonding. So as so often happens in science, when scientists don't understand something, they give it a name, which in this case is hydrogen bonding. What I show in future science is that hydrogen bonding, which accounts for 93% of the atoms in the universe, is the prime mover in the gravitational mechanism and bonds to neighboring atoms using gravity waves that radiate from the hydrogen to capture neighboring atoms. So in order to disintegrate molecules containing hydrogen, all we have to do is generate gravity waves, then change the phase of the gravity waves by 180 degrees to make anti-gravity waves. When we bombard hydrogen-containing molecules with anti-gravity radiation, the material will disintegrate. And this is what appears to have happened on 9-11. Anti-gravity generators located in the basements of the Twin Towers sent vertical beams of anti-gravity radiation skywards that turned the buildings to dust. And there is plen plenty of evidence to suggest that this is what must have happened. Wow, interesting. Um, interesting idea that both could be correct, that they've used both methods or technique to, to basically make happen what we see. Uh, obviously, tons of questions that, that arise from this, and, and we'll... And we'll get to it here and try to detail all this. Uh, what about the, the the possibility that, just to clear that off, first of all, that something else was used instead of this microwave weapon? Is there any possibility in your view, Maurice, that another type of technology actually was was uh, could have been used? Is there anything that suggests that there there could have be, I don't know, a more exotic version of a, of of a weapon that we just simply don't know about? Well, what's clearly evident is the disintegration of matter. And as I was just chatting a few minutes ago, if we are to, 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 to sort out how matter could disintegrate and blow away in the wind, then we have to get back to basics and look how it sticks together or integrates in the first place. So for me, there are some exotic theories out there. 
for example, that the aircraft that impacted with the towers didn't exist, that they were actually holograms, and lots of other theories. But uh, what seems sensible and rational and reasonable is the fact that those towers didn't hit the ground, and all the building materials that were involved in the building of those buildings Maurice Cotterell, good to uh, talk with you again. It was a while ago, but uh, we had a, a fun time last time. A lot of interesting things, uh, talking about future science and everything else. So it's uh, it's good to have you back again, Maurice. How have you been? I've been okay, Henry. Keeping busy. Thank you very much. Yeah, indeed. There's a lot of things going on, and and uh, what we're going to get into today, of course, is uh, is a very interesting topic, and it's uh, it's timely as well for those who've been following. Is so what happened is that about two months ago now. Uh, on, on as we're recording this uh, on the dot, as it were, April 14th, we uh, got a little snail mail. And it's always nice to get a snail mail, by the way. I really appreciate that. It's always fun. It feels like a privilege to, <laughs> to get a snail mail because we never get these any, anymore. But anyway, Maurice sent us a, 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 a regular mail in the mail uh, talking a little bit about some of the new work that he have been doing, connecting some of the dots. And I, I think we should read this letter here actually straight up to kind of get things going here a little bit. Uh, so Maurice says, Dear Henrik, since we last spoke, Dr. Judy Wood has published a book on 9-11, Where Did the Towers Go? In it, she proposes that the Twin Towers were destroyed through a process she calls dustification. She goes on to suggest that the U.S. government must therefore have used a secret energy weapon to destroy the towers. In Future Science, Forbidden Science of the 21st Century, which is uh, Maurice's latest book, I explained how anti-gravity radiation causes the molecular disintegration of matter. And I believe that this is what she unknowingly refers to, that is to say, I agree with her deductions. Moreover, she illustrates the damage caused to vehicles in the vicinity of the Twin Towers, which, for me, shows the same kind of destruction found on the returning military convoy of Saddam Hussein's army when retreating from Kuwait following the 1991 invasion, meaning that the U.S. possessed the technology as early as 1991 and used it on that occasion. And uh, you say, I'd be happy to talk to you and your listeners about this connection. And indeed, Maurice, we're very, very happy to have you with us to to talk more about this and to really get into this, uh, you know, this work of both Judy Wood and yourself and try to connect some of these dots here. Uh, why don't you tell us first, Maurice, when you first kind of got into Judy Wood's work, when you heard about it and, and why it piqued your interest? Well, uh, it goes back to when I actually saw the first evidence on the 9-11 incident, which, of course, clearly happened way back in 2001. I reached the conclusion that it must have been a false flag operation carried out by the CIA, uh, their intention being to control the American people through fear in an open-ended, uh, ostensible war on terror. Indeed, I believe that any reasonable person who studies the evidence will reach the same conclusion. So the question is not one of who did it or even why they did it, but one of how they did it. And, of course, there are several theories about what actually happened. One of the most plausible comes from the U.S. Institute of Architects. They believe that two aircraft colliding with the Twin Towers in the way that they did would not have caused the buildings to collapse in the way that they did. They point out that no steel frame building has ever collapsed through fire, and therefore the destruction of the buildings must have been contrived. The architects suggest that the explosive thermite was used to destroy the steel supporting columns of the building floor by floor. Opponents of the idea object by saying that such a controlled demolition would have taken years to organize and that the installation and planning of such a covert operation would have been detected before completion. In response, the architects, of course, reply by saying that installation of the equipment needed for demolition could have been carried out covertly on a need-to-know basis by a select group of CIA operatives based in the neighboring so-called Building Number 7. And they point to the same-day controlled demolition of Building 7 as a smoking gun that proves the same methods must have been used to destroy the Twin Towers. Only the CIA had the means, the motive, and the opportunity to destroy those towers and Building 7 in, in the way that they, it actually happened. Now, jo Dr. Judy Woods uh, arrived in the debate quite late in the day in 2010 with her book, Where Did the Twin Towers Go? Evidence of Free Energy Technologies on 9-11. I know she's she been talking about it a little bit before that, but exactly the published work uh, arrived at that stage. Yeah, go ahead. 